In 2013, I visited Carson Grove Elementary School. I went to talk to a Remembrance Day assembly. What I did not know is on that day, my life would be changed forever. Upon leaving Carson Grove, I realized one thing, that the military community and the refugee community in Canada were quite similar. I've served in the Canadian Armed Forces for 24 years. I have friends, I have family, I have co-workers and contemporaries that will tell me that this has been a military career. I don't necessarily agree with that. What I do think, though, is that these 24 years have been a succession of unique experiences based on beliefs, based on emotions, and based on very deep personal connections on a global scale. You know, it's one thing to read history. It's another thing to understand history. But to walk through history and see geopolitical events unfold in front of your eyes is an entirely different thing. It changes you. It can make the untangible tangible. It can turn nonfiction into fiction. It makes the sublime a reality. We as members of the Canadian Armed Forces deploy quite regularly to areas of combat. We see varying degrees of violence. We see varying degrees of human suffering. We see varying degrees of tragedy. However, what we also see is human resilience. What we also see is the survivability of us, which is incredible. However, being exposed to these scenarios, combat, humanitarian aid, can have an overwhelming effect on people. And sometimes people have a difficult time coping. What I say is that you get lost within yourself, a departure from self. But we're not the only ones in this space. First responders are in this space with us. When we look at all parties, privy to conflict, they're in that space with us as well. And specifically, young refugees are in this space with us too. What I see in that is harmonized communities. People that have gone through a similar experience can really help each other out to a great deal because of that similarity. But before I move on, let's talk about talking. Humans have understood terminology despite what language you speak or what you understand. We tend to shorten things, explains acronyms. This happens in combat, in combat zones, and warfare as well. We can look at 30 years of conflict in Northern Ireland. It was called the Troubles, something so complex. We can look at the Algerian Civil War. It was called the Event. And since 2011, in the Middle East, it's been called the Mishkil Kabir, the big problem. Let me share with you another one that explains complexity. This is one I've worked in. Let me tell you, there are plenty of things in this world that terrify me. What terrifies me most is poverty. What terrifies me most is children that have lost their curiosity. What terrifies me most is the nightmare that conspires against the dream to destroy futures. Those, to me, are terrifying. We'll move on to another one. It's been in the media quite a bit lately, I would say. This is a word that's losing its purpose. This is a word that should represent advocacy. This is a word that should represent safety and security and stability. But in going into schools and talking to kids themselves and educators and researchers, what I've found is that this word is now becoming a derogatory term, which is unfortunate. And what's needed is the ability to repurpose this word and give it back its original meaning. By doing that, we will help the very people that are seeking refuge. When I engage schools, when I talk to youthful audiences, I like to use visual metaphors. This is one right here. 
Everyone can see this picture, but no two people will see the same thing. It happens every time. I picked this because it describes us, and it describes what I see in the assistance I'm providing to schools as well as veteran communities. In this, you have the bright sky. You have the future. It's positive. It's good. But also in this, you have darkness, as you see below the fence. In that darkness, you have unawareness. You have secrecy. What you have is vulnerability. And the challenge that I face consistently is trying to assist people come out of the darkness and into the bright. I feel it's very important. And sometimes it doesn't always work, and I just try harder. When we look at the trends of immigration coming into Canada over 140 years, we can see two things. We see that it's increasing. I think that's a good thing, and I welcome that. The second thing is, if you look at the boxes, I've overlaid significant Canadian missions that have occurred in that same time. When you look near the end, you'll see a massive big box. What I see in that box is from the peacekeeping from Afghanistan, from Bosnia, is something else. What I see is that members of the Canadian Armed Forces are very likely to see the full evolution now of a refugee. And what that means is that there's potential we could see pre-conflict, during conflict, and post-conflict. The important thing to note, post-conflict happens here in Canada now. And these are the communities we want to engage. When I saw this and I did the research on this and I was going into schools, I decided I had to do something. So what I decided I'd do is I'd start writing. So I wrote a speech called The Promise. The Promise is based on nonverbal cues and the understanding that I was engaging audiences that the only part of what I say that I that I was going to articulate, they made it understand any of that. It was just the nonverbals. It was based on nonverbals such as music. It was based on nonverbals such as actions, such as this. A whole room of children snapping will cause them to laugh. And it doesn't matter what language they speak. It's a language of joy. It's a language of laughter. It's actually quite beautiful. I also decided when I wrote the speech to not talk about violence, warfare, misery, or tragedy. Going into the schools and trying, I didn't know what would occur. But the result, I would say, is quite profound. And I'm going to share with you one of these stories. In 2013, when I went into Carson Grove, I had just given the promise speech. And I was talking to one of the educators when a young boy came and tugged on my sleeve. I looked down and asked him what, what he would like. He told me he was from Kabul, Afghanistan, and I had just come from Kabul, Afghanistan. He looked at me, and he thanked me. After that, he did something unbelievable. He took a bracelet that he had on his wrist. He held it up. He said, I want you to take this in broken English. It'll protect you forever. Thank you. This is that bracelet. What he didn't know is in that interaction with that young boy, he changed my life forever. And as I see it, you can look at someone, but you may not be able to see them. Do we really look at people? When you do really look at a person, you see something different, and I saw it in this boy on that day. I just didn't see a boy. I saw compassion. I saw innocence. I saw love. And what I felt, it took a young boy to pull me out of that dark spot and that painting. At that moment, in that school, in 2013, that's when my Afghanistan actually ended, right there. From that moment, I decided that I could share this experience and grow it out. From the experience I had, maybe others could have this. And I looked at it in the guise of closure for some, such as myself, and an opportunity for others. 
As I went forward, I built teams of talk teams and went into schools and it grew. And what I found was that members of the Canadian Armed Forces are in a fantastic position to contextualize Canada. We can answer the questions that children have. And I've been asked many. And you have some of the fun questions, such are there, are there bears in Winnipeg? My answer always is, yes, there's one and he's yellow. <laughs> Google it. And then we get to the other questions. Those are much more difficult. When will I ever stop being bullied? Why does everyone hate me? Why am I being called a monster? When I think about these questions, I put it in context because I look at the person who's asking me. It sounds a bit like this. I was bullied by my government. Then I was bullied in a camp. And now I traveled halfway around the world and I'm being bullied again. And this leads to incredible vulnerability of people. And that's what I want to see. That's what I want to assist with, stopping that process. And how to do it is by connecting the veteran and military communities with refugee communities. And why I say that is because in the unique, unique aspect that many military members will have served in the very countries where this refugee population is coming from. There's a commonality, there's that harmonization. As I look forward to doing that and building it, I consider a few things. I consider it would look like this. In the case of the young refugees, I came from a tra traumatic experience. 30 years on, that's my fast forward. 30 years on, I'm now a doctor. I drive a fire truck, I'm a truck driver, I'm in the military. That traumatic event that I came from is becoming a story in my life, and just a story. It doesn't destroy me anymore. In the case of the military community, for those who have suffered, it answers the question of when I left that country, what happened to those people? And that's how I saw it. And moving forward, how I view it is that with both communities, we don't make you better. We make you stronger. By making people stronger, they can make themselves better. I think that's very important. And by doing that, we have the ability to heal together, to adapt together, and to build a nation together. I have a few minutes left here, and I'm going to say this because I think it's important. Words are spiritual, and ideas are spiritual. Standing on the stage and relaying an idea is a spiritual act, deeply. And for that reason, I dedicate every word that I said on the stage here today to the staff and the students of Carson Grove Elementary School who are working hard. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.